Good day. My name is Walter Adams from the Web and Media Technologies Platform at the Medical Research Council. My guest today is Professor Sarah Absina. Professor Sina received the NSTF BHP Bulletin TW Kambule Award to an emerging researcher for an outstanding contribution to science, engineering, technology, and innovation through research and its outputs over a period of up to six years after award of a PhD or equivalent in research. The award was sponsored by the National Research Foundation. Upon completing his electronic engineering degree, Professor Sina specialized in the field of microelectronic engineering. He completed all his qualifications at the University of Pretoria. He serves as the research group head for electronics and microelectronics in the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering. Professor Sina is also the director of the Carl and Emily Fuchs Institute for Microelectronics. Please join me now for part one of a two-part series of my interview with Professor Sara Absina. Can you briefly tell us what an electronic engineer does? So, engineers solve problems using technical skills, and the electronic engineer would solve problems using his knowledge and skills of electronics. I also see that electronic engineers, together with engineering technologists and a number of other professions, such as business analysts, uh, marketing experts, and so on, would enable a number of applications that would make our life easier. So, for instance, ensuring that our the mobile, a particular mobile phone has a reception uh, or a hardware that enables, even for this podcasting, you know, the electronics of a car or a computer, mm-hmm. all of those are things that would be included in the ambience of work that an electronic engineer would in fact would do. Okay. Related to the electronic engineer is the electrical engineer. What's the difference between the two? So the difference tends to get closer and you know the fields are gratefully converging. So I would say that both engineering disciplines of course solve problems. However mm-hmm. in my view electronic engineers focus their energy on electronics or like the current applications, whereas yes. electrical engineers, I suppose, engineer energy and power, including convert, including uh, conservation of electrical energy distribution. And today, I think there's also strong focus on renewable energy. So these disciplines are certainly converging. And for instance, power and electronics, energy harvesting are seen to be belonging to, in fact, both disciplines. What motivated you to pursue a career in electronic engineering? So I've had an interest in pursuing a discipline that explains physical phenomena, mm-hmm. which later moved into automation. So I saw electronics, such as remote controls, you know, could automate things and, and processes. And as I learned more about the discipline, I appreciated that what the discipline means for improving the way that we communicate. And perhaps my initial interest was not about how people communicate, but was how about how things communicate. And then it moved over to much broader to a much broader interest. So communication technology then became an interest not just for communicating, but also how communication could improve uh, people's lives. So I sometimes get lost, but then I remember that an an African proverb that sometimes one had to get lost is at times the way that we learn. So that's more or less how I actually kind of started to move into this direction. And and before I I, I was realizing that I'm moving, I found myself that I was actually in the discipline. Okay. Professor, in 2010, you received the University of Pretoria Laureate Award. For what did you receive that award? The University of Pretoria Laureate Award is a way of recognizing an, an alumni for his or her contribution to the discipline that the recipient enjoys or pursues. In my case, I served as an academic. Mm-hmm. In other words, I educate myself and others by conducting research, but also through community engagement. The particular award is given on holistic performance, and I was fortunate enough to have an excellent team of research students and engineers who partners and partnered at the time with me, enabling 
for our research focus in millimeter wave communication systems, which also relates to the theme of the NSDF NRF award. Yes. Your research is mainly on millimeter wave technology, but what other research opportunities are there in the field? Yeah, I'm glad that you actually asked the question broadly because that's how I have actually been, you know, I, I also try and think of this uh, technology. The field of electrical electronic or computer engineering continues to converge, and at the same time, there there's an opportunity to contribute to a, in a cross-disciplinary manner. The Department of Science and Technology recently released a roadmap for research development and innovation opportunities. And I will try to lift some of these market opportunities to actually give you a feel for the research opportunities that will emanate as a result of the fact that these market opportunities also exist. Okay. And so examples such as future wireless technologies and broadband service infrastructure, what, I would call, what we call e-inclusion, uh, astronomy and biomedical services, or sciences, smart infrastructure, you know, also enabling for mining, manufacturing, internet applications, content creation and delivery apps. So and as a research group, we are trying to address some of such research gaps, and this also helps us to contribute to the body of existing scholarly knowledge. We publish our thoughts extensively and solicit international peer review, and this also helps us in the way that we, can, we are able to reflect on what it is that we are doing. So the communication regulatory landscape is something that does need uh, some cultivation, and we envisage that a parallel effort in this regard is something that we, we will need to do. Um, so it will not; it is not simply only the microchips part that needs uh, to be addressing. Uh, so while that will uh, will end up maybe using less power and produce faster uh, data rate, I think there's a there's a whole broader set of uh, processes. Uh, that go about in ensuring that we will get to our goal. Separately, I understand that you've also been working on EPICS or engineering projects in community service. Could you tell us about the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers project supporting solar power for an orphanage in the Western Cape? Yeah, I, I appreciate in fact that you actually uh, gave a full form for IEEE um, I sometimes actually, although it is uh, traditionally for fields of electrical electronic engineers, I actually think of IEEE as a very broad organization today, mainly due to this convergence between what various engineers actually do. Sometimes I even think of IEEE as, as an institute of engineers and even everybody else. Mm. Well, I suppose that in this context, I think ethics becomes a little bit more relevant so EPICS in IEEE became in existence in around about 2009, and I had the pleasure together with uh, Kapil Dandekar, a, an associate dean of research at the, uh, Drexel College in Philadelphia, to start this initiative within IEEE. However, the concept actually was borrowed to a collaboration through Professor Lee Jamieson, who was an engineering dean at Purdue University, so do had started EPICS quite a while ago, I think already in the 90s. Okay. And we tried to expand the concept to IEEE. So EPICS and IEEE looks to work with non-profit organizations, universities and secondary schools, where the partnership together contributes to a given community. So in this regard, the graduate students at the University of Cape Town approached IEEE, an organization which I volunteer for, and this is how the particular initiative started. The Western Cape project was particularly impactful as graduate students led by one of the PhD students, David Oyadakun, worked with Imasi Tendane, and also which is also known as Imasi. Mm -hmm. And Imasi was founded by Mama Maposela and also aimed to provide education food, extramoral programming for orphans, abandoned, abused, and otherwise vulnerable children and those affected and impacted by HIV AIDS in South Africa. So the university students worked with Imasi towards a solar geyser installation 
And at the time, the home served some 64 children. So over and above the community engagement, it was attractive for us as IEEE volunteers to see IEEE student members who work with us and a whole group of international and national bodies or companies in soliciting sponsorship for this work. IEEE also served as a financial sponsor for this initiative. So that's in summary about the program and also the engagement that university students could do in developing an impact uh, through engineering in a community that they uh, that was close to them. Could you elaborate on career opportunities that the fields of electrical and electronic engineering offers? I had the chance to review this a short while ago mm -hmm. uh, for the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering at the University of Pretoria. So here there are three programs, uh, and there are three separate academic programs. So I will try and go through each one briefly to give you an, a, you know, a feel for the spectrum of career opportunities. So computer engineers, uh, research and development opportunities are available in communication, in computer systems, networking, peacekeeping operations, medical, transportation, software, and electronics companies in South Africa, but also all over the world. Electrical engineering graduates have also a wide range of opportunities. These include working for electric the electricity utility companies, mining houses, municipalities, consulting engineers, transportation, rail and sea companies. Uh, in, of course in South Africa, but again, most of these professions are quite applicable also around the world today. Yes. The opening of electrical and energy generation and distribution creates quite a bit of opportunities for entrepreneurs in South Africa and also abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so electronic engineering grads also have quite a wide range. And I think that you know it includes working for large and small companies. But today we are seeing this landscape change quite a bit. We are seeing that a lot of our grads are very soon also going and becoming entrepreneurs and are in this way self-employed, but are also employing others. So quite a bit of such opportunities exist, and I think we have uh, all sorts of South African universities tend to have accredited academic programs in engineering and engineering technology. And in this way, I think we're able to prepare our students to not just become engineers, but many a time to actually become leaders of engineering. That's good. Are there programs to develop previously disadvantaged students in the fields of electrical and electronic engineering? So many engineering academic departments offer a what we call a five-year program in addition to the traditional four-year program, which is a, a global norm for engineering. Mm -hmm. So the approach allows for some level of bridging, but I think it also allows students to settle into a complex environment that a university offers. In addition, there are a number of pre-university or sec or opportunities to bring and expose students at a pre-university level. So a whole range of, on, of online as well as on-site initiatives exist, and both in the formal and informal sector. For example, the Skyenzo Discovery Center located at the University of Pretoria hosts some 40,000 learners every year. And so, recently we enabled a setup at Skyenza that allows students the chance to explore a science rescue mission. The particular effort is, uh, is also IEEE driven and it is called eScientia. And it's a space exploration exhibit originating from Uruguay, but locally we tried to team it around the square kilometer array South Africa's uptake and central role in large-scale initiatives like SKA assists in developing appreciation by all in our society. So these type of engagement, a large number of these 40,000 learners are in fact pre, uh, are from previously disadvantaged communities. So in this way, through early exposure, as well as the bridging that I mentioned, I think we're able to uh, try and, uh, and have a, a, more, a, a broader system and a more diverse set of engineers that contribute to our society. Okay. What are the possible challenges and benefits in this field? I, I 
find that our universities in South Africa conduct very high cutting-edge research, which does certainly help to develop our higher-end intellectual base. I do think that there's also an opportunity to contribute in an area that I like to see as social innovation, and I think EPICS fits in this, in, in this mm -hmm. area. And perhaps in a more straightforward way, I think that to see engineering, but engineering for local or regional relevance, you know, I always try to try and think about, you know, engineering, but I also think about, you know, what is it that we can do to engineer South Africa? And, you know, if I take this particular discussion in the way that we try to think about millimeter wave communications, so, you know, this interest does exist, as we love 